With tonight's Conversations with Great Minds, I'm joined by Susan Kane. Susan is an author, lecturer, and former Wall Street corporate attorney. She graduated undergrad from Princeton University, received her JD from Harvard Law School. She's also the author of the critically acclaimed New York Times bestselling book, Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. She joins me now from our New York studios. Susan, welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for joining us. I, I thought I have to say, by the way, in, in addition to your book being extraordinary, your TED Talk was exceptional as well. I, I know it's, it's sort of semi-gone viral. It's brilliant. Um, what, oh, thank you. What brought you to this topic of introversion and extroversion? Well, you know, I'd say what brought me to it was really my, my own life history. I, I consider myself an introvert, and I think like many introverts, from the time I was a small child, you know, as early as four, um, I, I had the sense of the world having different expectations for me from the ones that I had for myself. And I couldn't, I, I obviously didn't have a language for describing this situation, but then it was something that I continued to notice as I grew older. and. Um, before I became a writer, I actually had a career as a Wall Street lawyer. And I, I looked around at my fellow attorneys, and I realized that many of the attorneys who I admired most um, were really good at what they did because they were more quiet, more reflective, more careful, more thoughtful, and, um, and that the, these traits were standing them in good stead, and that we had no real language for talking about identity in the workplace. We, we, we had the language of gender, and we had the language of race, but nobody was talking about personality style, even though back then, and, and since then too, I've come to believe that, that that's one of the most fundamental um, aspects of who we are. Let's, and, let's, uh, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. No, I was just going to say, and, um, and, and, and I believe that our society really undervalues the quieter side of the personality spectrum, and that that's, that's, a, that's a problem for introverts themselves, but it's a problem for society as a whole, because it means that we're not making the most of the talents of, of, of the quieter people. And, and, and by introversion, you're not meaning shy or necessarily even just quiet. You're well, what's your? De I'm familiar with Carl Jung's definition, and and you know uh, the whole Myers Briggs thing and all that. Right, what, right. Where, where, what are your points of agreement and disagreement with that? How how do you define introversion and extroversion? Well, I I really like the Carl Jung definition, which uh, in in contemporary parlance has come to be seen as: Do you recharge your batteries by? being by yourself or being sort of quietly with, with one or two people who you know well? Or do you tend to recharge your batteries by going out and, and being at a party? Um, so that's one way of looking at it. And, and another way that I think is really instructive is to understand that it's about how you respond to stimulation, um, physically as well as emotionally. So introverts feel that they're most alive and they're most switched on when they're in environments where there's less stimulation coming at them by which I don't mean intellectual stimulation, but rather just less, less of a sense of hubbub, less noise and fewer lights, that kind of thing. Sensory stimulation? Yeah, whereas extroverts really crave more stimulation in order to feel at their best. And when they're not getting it, they start to feel bored and restless. You know, there's a, th a theory about that that suggests that, that the, the thalamus uh, is is the uh, choke point. It's the all of all of our sensory inputs, with the exception of the olfactory sense, our smell, uh, go through the thalamus before they're distributed to the other parts of the cortex that process vision in the occiput and and the auditory in the in the in the parietal region and so on. And that the gain, the volume control of the thalamus is controlled largely by dopamine, and that people who have normally higher levels of dopamine tend to be quieter because the world is loud to them. They've got a lot of auditory input, a lot of visual, you know, everything they notice. And people who have low levels of dopamine tend to be very loud and, and uh, in fact, this is a theory of ADHD uh, or, or the hyperactive part of ADHD, tend to be very loud because the world is distant and quiet and they're trying to louden it up. And this is why stimulant drugs, which kick up dopamine, cause loud people to become quiet. Yeah, the paradoxical right, effect. Right. Does that make any sense to you in this context? Well, it's funny. You know, I think we're still at the very early stages of understanding the the neurological and biological bases of these personality styles. But um, one of the things that we're starting to see from the research is that 
one of the things that distinguishes introverts from extroverts is how active their reward networks are. Um, so extroverts actually seem to have more re active reward networks than introverts do, meaning, <coughs> excuse me, that when they see the prospect of something appealing, like a, an attractive stranger across the room, let's say, their, their networks get very easily activated. Um, and those networks are actually based on dopamine. So in, you know, in some ways, it's almost the opposite of, of the kind of framework you were talking about. Yeah, um, unless it's but, that they're low dopamine, so they're more sensitive to, you know, that the, the threshold has been, is different. Right, right. Um, but Like a hungry person notices food more. Right, yeah, and there's that way of looking at it as well. Um, but you know, I, I think what's interesting about seeing these styles through that lens is, um, first of all, just the idea that, that we kind of are who we are, and there's, mm -hmm. there's, you, you can will yourself to be different only to a certain degree. Um, and second, that these, these biological roots have really profound impact on the way we act in the world. So if you look at the th the, what I was just talking about with the reward networks, you know, having a more activated reward network means for extroverts, on the one hand, it, it, it's a quite lovely quality, and it means it, it gives you kind of the extra impetus that you need to go out and to seize the day and to just do it, you know, all, all these uh, precepts that are so valued in our society. Um, on the other hand, it also makes you more likely, if you're an extrovert, to go out and take a lot of risks, sometimes unwarranted risks. Um, and, and there's actually just a recent study that came out that found that Extroverts are more likely to go after um, immediate gratification, and introverts more likely to be able to wait for delayed gratification. So the, there are pros and cons to both ways of being, and they're rooted to some degree in our biology. Do you, do you think that, I mean, going back to, uh, well, actually, this whole spectrum of, of things, there are theories of these being these these different temperaments, I guess you could call them, being adaptive. You know, there's the theory that depression might be adaptive because mm -hmm. among primates, the depressive ones are the ones who disengage from society and become basically the sentinels for the community. And there was a study back in the 70s where they pulled the depressed chimps out of a group, and the and the group died because nobody was warning to the predators. And you could argue the depressed people among us are the ones, you know, the Albert Camus, they're the ones who are saying, look out. Uh, right, right. And and you know the ADHD. The the hunter versus farmer theory that you know some people are are you know more that society benefits from having both that, that you know the, the, the do you think that there's a, an ad adaptive or a maladaptive aspect to either introversion or extroversion yeah i absolutely do and i think it's adaptive um, one of the most interesting things that i found from my research is that there are kind of in quotation marks, introverts and extroverts in almost every single species in the animal kingdom, and this is true all the way down to the level of fruit flies. Um, and, and the reason for this is exactly what you're suggesting, that, that the two types have different kinds of survival strategies. So over the course of evolutionary history, um, one type survives better in one condition and one type in the other condition. Um, there was this amazing study of pumpkin seed fish where the biologist David Sloan Wilson went to a pond of fish and dropped a, a, a trap in the middle of the pond. And the more extroverted fish went swimming straight into the trap. Um, if the trap had been a real predator, those fish would have been eaten. And it would have been the introverted ones who were kind of cleaving to the sides of the pond and not going anywhere near the trap. They were the ones who would have survived. Um, but when he managed to get the introverted fish back to his lab along with the extroverted fish, in that case, the extroverted fish did better because they, they were more comfortable, more quickly adapting to a new environment and starting to eat and go about their business, whereas the introverted fish were, were freaked out by the new environment, as I think introverts, the introverted humans kind of know this. You know, they, they often need a period of adjustment when they're in a new situation, really just like the fish. That's, that's it's remarkable. It's, it's uh, Dr. Robert Moises, I think it was in the book The Edison Gene, um, did this research on traditionally agricultural societies and found that they had 
more people who were the opposite of ADHD or hyperactive or what might be interpreted right. as extroverted. And right. because they were traditionally people who for years and years and years would just pick bugs off plants all day long, right. you know, boring right. stuff. Right. And that hunting gathering societies had higher levels of, of this. AD and uh, you could almost translate ADHD for introversion or for extroversion rather and, and the, the, the farmer part for introversion in that. Um, do you think that our society favors one over the other? Oh gosh, absolutely. And, and you know, that's really, at the end of the day, that's why I wrote my book, because I, I believe the bias in our society for, in, for extroverts and against introverts is deep and it's profound. I, I, I really believe it's as deep as, um, let's say, where women were at the time of the 1950s or the 1960s, mm -hmm. uh, where we really, we have a cultural preference for the kind of person who is bold, um, who's assertive, who's comfortable in the spotlight. And, um, and children know this from a very early age. They know it from the minute they get to school. They often know it from parents who might be very well-intentioned, but who also from an early age communicate to their children that, that they should be more out there, they should be more gregarious. And, um, and children feel these things very deeply, and, and adults do too. I, I, I get hundreds of letters um, constantly from people telling me these stories. Yeah, that's remarkable. I, I, I want to get into whether uh, that you, you, you mentioned like women and men, um, whether the you know that that has, it turns out to be temporal. It seems, or at least it, it seems to be changing. Whether also our society's preference for extroverts over introverts is temporal. We'll, we'll get to that right after the break, if that's all right with you. We'll be right back. More conversations with great minds with Susan. Um, Susan, just uh, as we as we hit the break, uh, you were mentioning society's preference for extroverts and how you were drawing an analogy to society's preference arguably for men over women or at least in terms of power situations mm -hmm. in the 1950s mm -hmm. versus today. Um, there, uh, there are probably apocryphal stories about times when women had met power over men, you know, the Amazons and uh, as in women, not the river. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and actually, you know, some indications of some cultures, the matrilineal matriarchal cultures of, of many Native American tribes and of the Icelanders, for example. Um, are there times in have there been times in our culture in modern American culture in, in mm -hmm. the last five centuries uh, or European culture Western culture when introversion has been prized over extroversion it's a great question I would not say there was a time that introversion was prized over extroversion and nor, nor am I calling for such a time you know what I'm what I'm really calling for is a time of balance between the two, just as I think many of the early activists for women's rights were looking for equality between men and women, you know, not, not right. the ascent of, uh, of, a, of a matriarchy. Um, but yeah, you know, interestingly, during the time of, let's say, the 19th century, up until the, t the turn of the 20th century, we lived in a society that historians call, call, call a culture of character and then moved at the turn of the 20th century to a culture of personality. So in the culture of character, we were all living in an agricultural society. People were living in small towns alongside people they had known all their lives, and they valued each other based on, based on their internal worth, based on their character, based on the good deeds that they performed for their neighbors or, or that they performed when no one else was looking. And so in a society like that, there wasn't really such a distinction between introverts and extroverts. It was more a question of who you were. But then at the turn of the 20th century, um, with, with the rise of big business and, and urbanization and people leaving these small towns and venturing forth into cities where they, they now had to look for jobs and go for job interviews and pay sales calls and basically look to to distinguish themselves from other people and to make a good impression on people who they had never met before, all of a sudden that is when qualities of, of personal magnetism and charisma and dominance and these kinds of things rose to the fore. And in, in a way we're really still living with that heritage today. Um, I, I think we're reaching a kind of turning point where we're realizing that the, the values of a sales-based society are not really enough for us um, and we're we're focusing now 
on questions of innovation and this kind of thing. And, and that's actually been in the making for the last 20 or 30 years as we've seen the rise of the tech industry. And I, I, I think people have started to see that um, people of all kinds of personalities have been contributing in pretty profound ways. So we're starting to see this shift, but it's still going to be a long time coming. To appreciate the introvert Steve Wozniak's as much as the extrovert Steve Jobs's. Exactly, but exactly. But that, that era that you talked about, the late 19th century, uh, you read on Walden Pond, and, and uh, I mean, it's been 40 years since I read it, but it, I, I, I remember thinking at the time, Thoreau had to be the world's most eloquent introvert and and arguably Emerson and I suppose Walt Whitman although he liked he did like to you know travel around and share his poetry but <laughs> um, are, were those the 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 kind of uh, speakers of their time who exemplified introversion as a cultural value or character as a cultural value yeah, you know, they were some of them. I think arguably Lincoln might have been that kind of a person. Mm -hmm. He was actually um, praised by, I think it was Emerson, as, as a man who did not offend by superiority. You know, and he, he had a very modest um, self-presentation, which was prized at the time. But also, you know, even if you go across the pond to the, the romantic poets of, of Great Britain, you also saw this kind of celebration of the solitary thinker, the solitary figure who felt things deeply. These things were prized at that time, and we've, we've lost sight of that more recently. Though so I will say, too, you know, um, when, when you talk about, well, Thoreau must be the world's most eloquent introvert, I think there are a lot of eloquent introverts out there. Um, I think if you look probably at many of the great artists and writers working today, you also find a lot of introverts. But it's just that there's a pressure nowadays to really be able to go out and also be a public spokesperson at the same time. And yet there are some who, and you talk about this, uh, your own experience with this, some who, who have learned how to dance in both worlds. I, I, if you score me on a Myers-Briggs, I'm an extreme introvert. And okay. I've always worked in radio and I've worked as a writer, yeah. which are actually fairly solitary things. With radio, it's one person, one microphone, even in TV. It's one person, yep. one camera, although in TV I find a lot of my colleagues are clearly extroverts. In radio, most of my colleagues are clearly introverts. Um, I have noticed the same thing just going on my book tour. I would say, a pro I don't know, 85% of the radio hosts who have interviewed me, if not more, um, are introverts, and TV is the opposite. Yeah, yeah I think the media, yeah. th those two mediums uh, uh, are, are more appropriate for those guys, it seems. But so, but I, for myself, you know, when I was 21 years old, I took a Dale Carnegie course, and I learned how to pr pretend I was an extrovert. And it was right. a very, very right. useful skill. Um, you went through a similar learning. Can you tell us about that, and what's your advice to introverts who might feel intimidated by the extroverts of the world or, or might, you know, want to, to use their introversion in a way in the extrovert's world? Right, right. Well, I mean, personally for me, I, I, I guess I've been going through that in one way or another for most of my adult life because I went to law school very very soon out of college um, and in law school and, and then I practiced law for about seven years and so obviously doing those things you have to kind of be out there um, being able to present and being able to speak but public speaking in particular was always difficult for me it was always something that I found kind of scary not all introverts do by the way some are really comfortable with public speaking but it wasn't that way for me um, but you know, I really systematically worked through my fear by trying to practice public speaking in small, manageable doses until I reached a point where I'm actually now pretty comfortable with it. And, um, and I'd say to introverts in general that it's important to have those kinds of skills, even, even if it's not your preferred way of being, to be able to kind of step out of your preferred way of being temporarily um, for the sake of a greater project, you know, the sake of a, a work project or the sake of, of a person. Um, like you might want to throw your extroverted wife a surprise party, even if that's not your cup of tea. So I think acquiring the skills to do those things and, and sort of judiciously pushing yourself to do those things is a good thing as long as at the base you're honoring who you really are and you're willing to come back to your core self. What's, and you're not kind of pushing yourself out there all the time. 
What's the nature of, in your experience and in your research, uh, what's the outcome of introverts pairing with extroverts in interpersonal relationships, in marriage or, or those, those kinds of really deep friendships? Um, do introver should introverts be looking for extroverts or should they be looking for introverts or are there pitfalls for both that people need to know about? Yeah, that's such a good question. And I, I, I was curious about the same thing when I did my book research. And what I found is that there are pros and cons to both ways. And in fact, you know, it, it, if you look at the research, it seems that about 50% of couples are introvert, extrovert, and then the other 50% are, are assorted of couples where people are, are mating with their own kind. Um, and yeah, it, there are pros and cons to both. For introvert, extrovert couples, there's the obvious advantage of, um, of a kind of sense of the whole being greater than the two parts. You know, each one is complementing the other, and each one is attracted to the other because they they, they have uh, talents that the other does not have. Um, but the downside for these couples, well, there are a bunch of them, probably more than I have time to tell you now, but I, I have them in my book. Um, but I'd say that the main one that I heard about over and over again is the question of, well, how often are we going to go out as a couple? You know, you can have an extrovert who whose idea of the perfect weekend is is party after party, and the introvert who wants to stay home and snuggle on the sofa. And so what do you do about that? And, um, and, and it really calls for a lot of maturity and self-awareness and being willing to negotiate a, a kind of compromise that works for both. Um, and then on the flip side, if you have two introverts married to each other, you can kind of you, you understand each other really well, but you might feel a sense of lacking the person who's going to kind of push the two of you out a little bit, because everybody needs that to some degree. And, uh, and when I've interviewed couples who are made, of, made up of two extroverts, you sometimes find them they're kind of spinning out there. Um, and they, they say that they lack a sense of anchoring. Um, and, and they don't spend enough time together, because they're, they're always so outward turned. Wow. So, I, I, uh, yeah. So pros and cons both ways. Yeah, and and I'm I'm sorting all these couples that I know and going, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a funny thing with with this whole subject. You you can really start seeing the entire world through this lens. Yeah. And everybody you know. Much yeah. of what you've written about and talked about has been how int introverts can learn how to behave like extroverts, can learn extroversion skills, as it were, uh, to function in the extroverted world. Is there a flip side to that? Do you have lessons for extroverts in how to become more introverted? Yeah, and I, you know, in general, I, I would not say my main, um, my main goal is to make introverts act more like extroverts. It's more really to... Um, to celebrate the qualities of both. And so for, for some of the ways that extroverts would do well to act more like introverts, I mean, there's a few of them. But um, for one, for example, is we know from studies of creativity that the most creative people across a, a broad variety of fields over time have been people with serious streaks of introversion. Um, these were people who are comfortable going off by themselves and working deeply by themselves and, and sitting by themselves so that they could kind of pull their own original thoughts um, from deep inside their minds. And if you're not comfortable with or willing to put in that solitary time, you might not be able to get to that place. So, so one thing for extroverts is simply to be to, to develop the comfort um, of spending time alone. And then another interesting thing is uh, the sociologist Adam Grant, a management professor at at um, the Wharton School, recently did this amazing study where he found that introverted leaders often deliver better outcomes than extroverts do, and the reason is that they're more likely to let their employees run with their ideas and implement their ideas, whereas extroverts can get really excited about what they're doing and, um, and put their own stamp on things more. And so other people's ideas don't ever see the light of day. So one thing extroverts can do to take a, a page from the introvert playbook is to just kind of step back a little bit and let other people take the spotlight and, and, and run with things. Susan Kane, absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. It was such a pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. To see this and other Conversations with Great Minds, go to our website at conversationswithgreatminds.com.